We need you. Oh, how we need you. And Lord, we pray today that you would teach us just how much we need you. Lord, that you would bless us with your presence. Your Holy Spirit's been here since the early hours of this morning and has prepared this place, this time of worship. And you've called us from slumber to your glorious presence. And so today, Lord, we welcome you. And we welcome ourselves to what you will do in us and through us as you move among us. So be in our fellowship, be in the songs that we sing, be in the word as it goes forth this morning. And when we leave this place, Father, may we have learned the desperate desire of our hearts, the need that we have for you. And we pray this in your holy and precious name, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Friends in the Lord, from Psalm 66, 1 through 9 this morning, as our call to worship, these words from the psalmist. Shout with joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies crunch before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Come and see what God has done. How awesome his works in man's behalf. He turned the sea into dry land and they passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Praise our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. Let's remain standing and sing together this morning.
Some of those songs, right, because he lives, are just a testimony to our faith. A testimony to the fact that no matter what, in all things, at all times, in all ways, God is at work in the lives of those who believe in him. And so whether it brings tears to your eyes, whether it brings a butterfly in your heart, because he lives is one of those songs that just radiates the profession of our faith. <laughs> It was at a time and in a place that Jesus rode into Jerusalem that the crowd hailed him and said, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the son of David. And in between that space of that Hosanna cry and that cry of crucify him, crucify him, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. We read from Matthew's account the <coughs> underhandedness, the sneaky conniving of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, the desire to trip Jesus up. Get him to recant and to say that none of the Old Testament is important. What's important is that you worship me. And in saying that, that they, they believe Jesus is blasphemy. So here from Matthew 22, verses 34 and following, we have this commandment. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together among themselves, and one of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in all of the law? And when that teacher of the law, when that, when that lawyer asked Jesus this, he's looking and he's saying, of all of the Ten Commandments, if we could summarize everything, Jesus, in all of the Ten Commandments, which is the most important? And Jesus responds, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But I'm telling you today, a second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And then Jesus presses it even further when he says, I tell you, I tell you, not until, not until I come again will the law be abolished. Not until every I is dotted and every T is crossed will we be able to deal, do away with the law and the prophets. I am that fulfillment. And it's with that that we profess our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the representative agent of Almighty God the Father. And friends, I'm eager, excited to be able to do this again this, this Sunday with Riley Kleinstra. Riley's come and she stood before your council and, and she's professed her faith before the elders and deacons of this church and said, yes, Jesus Christ is Almighty God in the flesh. Yes, I believe that the Bible teaches exactly what the creeds and confession teach, which is that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Yes, I believe. And I'm willing to take my stand on what it is, I believe. So Riley, I'd ask you to stand and give your response to these four questions this morning before God, your family, and this church family. Riley, the first question is this. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That he was sent to redeem the world? And do you love and trust him as the one who saves you from your sin? And do you, with repentance and joy, embrace him as the Lord of your life? Riley, the second question is, do you believe that the Bible is the Word of God, revealing Christ and His redemption, and that the confessions of this church faithfully reflect this revelation? 
And question number three is, do you accept the gracious promises of God which were sealed to you in your baptism? And do you affirm your union with Christ and his church, which your baptism signifies? And fourth and finally, do you promise to do all you can with the help of the Holy Spirit to strengthen your love and commitment to Christ by sharing faithfully in the life of the church, by honoring and submitting to its authority, and do you join with the people of God in doing the work of the Lord everywhere? Riley, what is your answer? I do, Amen. And people of God, we do not sit idly by in this blessed profession. You see, ever before Riley knew when she was baptized, that was a sign that, that Christ was working through his grace in her life. And so today as she stands, congregation, I'm going to ask you to stand and join with her. And, and the affirmation is simply this. Congregation, do you promise to walk faithfully with Riley, to teach her and, and instruct her and hold her accountable to these vows that she just made before God and, and his church? Do you promise to uphold her, to guide her, to encourage her, to hold her accountable in life and witness? Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, if it's your desire to affirm the say, we do, God helping us. Congregation, what's your answer? We do, God helping us. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Riley, I have a certificate and a gift I will give you after the service is done this morning, but it is my honor and privilege to welcome you to full participation in Christ's church here represented. So welcome. Friends, as we go to prayer this morning, uh, Don and Nancy had reported that Lacey and Jonah um, gave birth to their baby, uh, Liam, and um, Lacey was in the hospital earlier this week uh, with with baby Liam, and we praise God and God's miraculous gift of healing both, both Lacey and Liam are home again and doing quite well, so praise God for that. Um, and we have um, new birth in the uh, Tucker family uh, with Madison Grace and uh, a bunch of stuff that's listed on the prayer page and a bunch of areas in which to pray into. Uh, friends in the Lord, I'm asking uh, this morning before we go to prayer, are there any prayer concerns, announcements, or praises in the midst of God's people? Yes. Thanks that Kathy can be here. Amen. I did see that. Kathy, welcome back. It's good to see you. We celebrate a God of healing, amen. And there's a bunch of our uh, winter birds that have returned. I, I guess, I don't know if I like that term or not, but welcome back to the Vanderbillons and um, to the Mirrors. And yeah, just welcome back to all of you. Uh, so let's pray together. God, on a morning like this where your grace to us is visibly displayed through the profession of faith of Riley. Father, thank you for the ways in which you engage us, in which you take the feebleness of our flesh and, and pour your spirit into us and send us forth with a message to proclaim to the world around us. Send us forth with a profession on our lips that you are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Send us forth to be your agents of reconciliation and grace, your agents of shalom, perfect peace in all of its fullness here in this world. Father, thank you for moving and sustaining and holding us. Thank you, Lord, for everything you give us. And, oh, Father, the, the honesty of our hearts this morning has to begin with confession and repentance for all of those times that we've taken your will and your way for granted in our lives. Of all those times, Lord, where we made it more about us and less about you. Of all of those times, Lord, where fear has monopolized and crippled us and where the boldness that you give us 
boldness that comes through the Holy Spirit's power and presence, Lord, it's fallen behind and into the dark recesses of our hearts. So, Father, I pray for a reigniting, a desire to be bold for you, to let our lives speak to who we are because of whose we are. And Lord, that strips us of identity in our family, or identity in our job or career, or identity in our kid, kids and children and grandchildren. It strips us of the ability of our own selves, Lord, of our hands and of our knowledge. And it lays us bare before you so that you, Father, fill us with your grace and presence. So that you, Father, ignite our faith. And help us walk, living our lives out loud for the world to see. So even as we pray for Riley and for you to do this great work in her life, Lord, we pray for each of us that you would ignite a passion, a holy passion, for you. Lord, we look out and we think of the prayer sheet and we see your evidence of grace and Lord and Jonah and Lacey's life and little baby Liam and Father thank you for the healing for the health that you've given both baby and mom that they're able to be home Lord that you are the orchestrator of time and that and your perfected time you blessed Lacey and Jonah with a with a healthy baby so, Father, thank you for that. We see that same thing, Lord, and in Madison. And, Father, we thank you for that gift of life to the Tuckers. And, Father, we just pray that you would bless each family. For others, Lord, we see that we're recovering. And so, Lord, today we see that visibly displayed through Kathy's presence among us, and we say thank you for the gift of healing in the Wykstra home. And, Lord, we know that we'll be in places and in situations in this week ahead where you will try our faith, you will test our faith. You will force us, Lord, to rely on you. But Father, the reality is this, if life were easy, then there would be no need for you. And so you make it just difficult enough so that we have to hold ourselves dependent to you. And so we affirm that, Lord, with you at our, on our front, with you hemming us in on every side, Father, we affirm that your grace and presence surround us and challenge us and call us forward to march out and to march through the wilderness wandering in each of our lives and to make our lives a living example, a living testimony to you, O oh Lord. So would you do that great work in our lives? And Father, now as we turn our attention to Scripture, as we sit under what it is you've taught us through the story of Abram and Mount Moriah. Father, we pray for your blessing on your word as it goes forth. We pray boldly with Isaiah that where your word goes forth, it accomplishes everything for which you've purposed and everything for which you've sent it into our world today. So though the story is a familiar story, though the text is text we've been studying for some of us since Sunday school. Father, we pray that you would open our hearts to receive it well this morning and that you would plant a different message in our lives, a message that's shaped and formed by your word, which is living and alive. And in order for that to happen, oh Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit's power and presence. We pray that you would wash us thoroughly, that you would convict us where we need to be convicted, that you would transform us more and more to look like Christ and less like the people we were when we came here this morning. So Father, to your name, 
be all the honor as we read your word. Be all the glory and be all the power, both now and forever. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to Genesis 22. Genesis 22, we'll read verses 1 through 19 this morning of Genesis 22. It's the story of Abraham on top of Mount Moriah. And the title of the sermon this morning is The Journey of Faith. And we'll see how Mount Moriah plays into the journey of faith. So read it together then from the word of the Lord from Genesis 22, verses 1 through 19. These words. Sometime later, God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he said. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. So early the next morning, Abram got up, and he loaded his donkey, and he took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. So on the third day, Abram looked up, and he saw the place in the distance, and he said to his servants, You stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, and he placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up, and he said to his father, Abraham, and he said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son Abraham, where are you alive? The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abram answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And when they reached the place God had told them about, Abram built an altar there. He raised the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac. He laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. Because you've not withheld him from me. You have not withheld from me your son, your only son. So Abram looked up. And there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abram called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time, and he said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all the nations on earth will be blessed because you've obeyed me. And then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Beersheba, and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of our God. Amen. I want to begin this way. Hi, my name is Derek, and I'm a bibliophiliac. Anybody know what a bibliophiliac is? A bibliophiliac is somebody who immerses themselves in books. It's a bookworm. So in other words, I can say, hi, my name is Derek, and I'm a bookworm. And I wonder this morning, are there anybody, is, is anybody else, I'm, am, am I on an island all by myself and being a bookworm? Or is there anybody else that's a bookworm? Denise is smiling because I know we talk often about Rachel's love for books, and I'm right there. I'm right there with Rachel. I mean, I, my life can be a book, and I will be perfectly happy. In fact, in fact, so content would I be that my house literally could be burning down around me, and if I had a book in my hands and I was reading a story, and the storyline was so gripping and engaging, I'd be like, let's go out and get the hot dog forks. Let's go get the marshmallows and the graham crackers. Man, it's, it's a party. Dude, your house is burning. 
No matter. I'm like, what, man? I'm, my life is not what's around me. My life is lived from the printed word. So let's think about that and why I would start there this morning. And the reality of why I would start there is simply this. What does a story need to captivate us and grip us? It's okay to talk in church. What does a story need to captivate and grip us? It needs action. Conflict. What else? It needs an engaging, a drawing in, right? We if, if there's, we can tell, friends, within the first chapter of a book, whether or not we're drawn into the storyline, right? Within the first chapter, we can be drawn into the storyline, and either the author captures us and draws us into the storyline, or we set the book aside and say it's not worth reading. So why would I start this morning, Genesis 22, with this analogy to being a, a, a reader, to being a person who's consumed by books, to being in love with the written word. It's simply because of this. Because if that author does not draw us in, what happens is we take two or three steps backward from that book and we say, man, that's not for me. <clears throat> and when I look at Abraham, and when I look at Abraham's faith, it is really easy for me to go to the top of Mount Moriah with Abraham and to say, man, I wish I had the faith of Abraham, but because I don't, I'm taking a giant step backwards. Good for Abraham, not so good for Pastor D. There's, there's a disassociation that happens, friends, when we read Scripture. That, that we continually do this with the giants of the faith. Abram's just one example. Job. Job's another great illustration of somebody who can have so much faith with the world's crumbling down around him that we look at Job and we say, awesome for Job. Not so awesome for me. So I want us to, to engage Abraham. Because I believe the journey of faith that Abraham is on speaks to the journey of faith that each of us are on. But if we keep doing this number with Abraham, we don't ever get past the point where this association is done away with so that we can fully engage and fully enter into the story of Abraham. Genesis 11 is the first time we come across the name Abram. It's not Abraham yet because God hasn't called him yet. Genesis 12, even as a idol worshiper, Abraham starts being called out, being singled out by Almighty God. You see, we don't remember the history of Abraham well enough to remember that he was called from, from idolatry to a faith encounter with Almighty God. God singled him out and said, Abraham, go to a land I will show you. For many of us, that would make us bristle, right? How many of us are planners? How many of us live planning out absolutely every single detail of our day, of our week, of our month? Here's the thing. If you and I were called by Almighty God to journey forward, in faith, as Abraham was, we want more detail. We'd be bold enough to say, God, I, I believe you're calling me. I believe you're singling me out for this task. I believe that your voice is, go to a land I will show you. Um, God, can you be a bit more specific? Can you maybe just point me in a general direction? Go to Moriah. Moriah is a big area, God. Oh, well, I'll show you when you're going where I want you to go. You see, for you and I, we wouldn't be content with that, would we? I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. Would we be content with that? I, I want details, God. I, I want to check it against my timetable, God. I, I want to check it against my plans, God. And only in checking it would we say, all right, I'm 
said about for Moriah. I know which mountain I'm to go to. It's the third one in, in, in this long string of five mountains that I see off in the distance. It's the third one. No, God doesn't work that way. He says, go. Go. And, and once you get there, I'll show you what it is I have in mind for you to do. Go to a land I will show you. Go to Moriah, the land of Moriah. I'll show you in your going. You see, that's what faith is about. Faith. Let's define it a minute. Alex, next slide. Faith from Scripture, we read it this way. From Hebrews 11, that great testimony to faith, we read verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not yet seen. And then if we, if we dial that in, the Reformed Confessions from Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer 21, the question of true faith True faith is not only a sure knowledge by which I hold as true all that God has revealed to us in Scripture, it's also a wholehearted trust which the Holy Spirit creates in me by the Gospel that God has freely granted not only to others but to me also forgiveness of sins, all my sins are wiped out, eternal righteousness because of Jesus Christ and because of the forgiveness of sins because of Jesus Christ and because of the close of eternal righteousness because of Jesus Christ God grants me salvation but nothing none of these gifts are gifts that I earn instead these are all gifts that God gives because of his grace all gifts God gives because of Jesus Christ and if we take both of those definitions together and combine them, then what happens is we start seeing the magnificently multifaceted, prismatic dimension of faith. You see, faith has to be defined in order that we understand what faith is. Faith is the guarantee of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things yet to be. Faith is that which enables us to fully trust the truth of Scripture, especially when it comes to something so incredibly amazing as the gospel message. Faith is that which allows us to stake our very life, both now and forevermore, on Almighty God's grand design for our lives. Next slide. John Calvin, I had to throw a good reformer in there. John Calvin says faith is this. Now we shall possess a right definition of faith if we call it a firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence towards us, of God's goodness towards us, which is founded upon the truth of the freely given promise in Christ Jesus, which is then both revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And the conviction, faith, friends, in the life of the believer is an incredibly important component. But let me ask you a question. When it comes to faith, when's the last time you seriously considered faith in your own life? You see, because if I look at my life and everything is going honky-dory and everything is beautifully on track and all of my plans and all of my purposes are working out and life is one grand adventure after another, and you would ask me, hey, do you got faith? Man, it's easy to have faith when life is great. But the testimony of life, our life especially, is that when you become a Christian, God doesn't pick you up. God doesn't insulate you with bubble wrap and set you over here and say, okay, now I'm going to protect you from absolutely every adversity, from absolutely everything that's bad, from absolutely anything that you have to worry about. Now I'm going to set you over here and, and, and make you a trophy. Instead, God throws us back out into the world and says, now live for me. Let people see that you are mine by the way you live your life. St. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel always. Use words when necessary. And so what happens is that God purposefully challenges us by placing us in the valley of the shadow of death. Simply to say to us, do you trust me? Do you trust me? 
Alex, the next slide. Congregation participation, which you know I'm very fond of. So I want you guys to participate in this silly little experiment. And, and the question is quite simple. Which crystal is more visually stimulating to you, A or B? B. How many would say A? Crystal A is more stimulating to me. Okay, so there's a couple people in our congregation this morning, God bless you, that are ordered and like life to be ordered. How many would say Crystal B is more visually stimulating? Yeah, the majority of us are those that understand that there's highs and lows. There's scratches and scuff marks. There's peaks and valleys. There's times where beauty emerges by having to go through some pretty hard spots. You can't see it real well on this picture, but that crystal B, I have it in my office, and it has gouges up and down the side of it. It has peaks and valleys, high spots and low spots, dull finish, bright finish. All of it to say that, all of it to say simply this, God is fashioning and forming us in the peaks and valleys of life. God is fashioning and forming us to get some scratches and bruises. God is fashioning and forming our life of faith to be one that has highs and lows. Riley, we've talked about life, right? We've talked about the reality that just because you stand up before the congregation today the journey of faith that God has had you on and will continue to have you on doesn't insulate you from the reality of the world around. We've talked about how hard it is to hold up faith in a secular classroom. We've talked about these things. I've talked with my middle schoolers all the time, and one question that I've asked them in the recent past is simply this, when does your faith grow and mature the most? When you're on a mountaintop or when you're in the valley trying to push that rock up so that you can get up out of the valley of the shadow of time. When does your faith grow the most? Now I appeal to you, friends, your faith grows the most when you're walking up or in the middle of the wilderness wandering. You see, because when life is easy, faith is taken for granted. But man, oh man, when life is hard, that's when I need to know that God's got my back the most. That's the story of Abraham. That's the story of Mount Moriah. That's the story of life. So when does your faith grow the most? It grows the most when you're in the valley of the shadow of death. When you're trudging up the mountain. Faith, friends, that's living and vibrant and active and alive. A faith that will sustain the harsh demands and testings that this world will place upon it is a faith, next slide, that is forged in the crucible of real life living. Faith that is alive and active and vibrant and living is faith that is forged in the crucible of real life living. It's journeying through the highs and lows that life throws at you. It's, it's picking up a few scratches and scars along the way. It's navigating the unexpected dips and turns. And in it all, it's saying, God, I pray you're with me because I can't do this journey any other way than if you're with me. Faith, friends, is forced in the crucible of real life living. Which is why, friends, though we may look at Crystal A and say, man, I, 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 I wish my life looked like that, there's none of us that are here this morning whose lives are as perfect as that first crystal. Next slide. It's that through Scripture's own testimony, Almighty God will test and try your faith continually in order to grow and develop your faith, in order to mature your faith. It's the
the question, I don't know if you can see the dialogue box, but it's the question that God asks each of us. I have a plan for you. Do you trust me? Do you trust me enough to follow me wherever I lead you? Abraham, do you trust me to go to Moriah with Isaac? And see, for Abraham, Isaac isn't just a son. Isaac is sacred. Isaac is special. Isaac is that, that one thing that Abraham can look at and put his finger on and say, now I know I'm blessed because I have this son. Because I have this covenant promise. Because God granted it. Now I know I'm blessed. But watch this. Abraham, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your son, the one that you love very much, the one that you love more than anything else in this world, the one that you have staked your legacy on. The most valuable thing in your life. And Abraham, I want you to go to Moriah. And, and, and this will be a journey, Abraham, that will test your faith like none other. Because Abraham, as, as you get to Mount Moriah, I want you to, to travel up the mountain. And I, I want you to take Isaac, your beloved. And I want you to place him on the altar. And I want you to sacrifice him to me. That's what I want you to do, Abraham. Scripture never tells us what questions Abraham asks, does it? It never says that there was hesitation on Abraham's part, does it? Instead, it says Abraham did exactly what God asked Abraham to do. He gathered the wood. He gathered the fire. He took two of his best men with him. And when he gets to that place where he knows what's expected of him, he says to his men, hey, you guys stay here. Stay right where I have you. We'll come back, but you stay here. We have to, me and my son have to go and worship. Even in the middle, you see, because faith testing comes from those who are closest to us, doesn't it? Even in the middle of the journey up the mountain, when I, his own beloved son looks at him and says, um, aren't you forgetting something, old man? Like, I got the fire. Or I got the wood on my back. You got the fire in your hand. But aren't you forgetting something? Aren't you forgetting the sacrifice? Where's the ram? Notice, Abraham doesn't look at Isaac and say, oh, very perceptive, so. You're, you're the sacrifice. Because I'm telling you, friends, if Isaac knew what it was that was expected of Abraham, Isaac would have bolted. He would have been like, check you later, I'm out of here, you're crazy. So Abraham never tells Isaac anything about what God's expecting of him. He just says, God, my son, will provide. That's faith, friends. In the middle of it all, when God asks Abraham for his most important possession, he looks at his son, the one that's dearest to him, and says, don't worry about it. God's got it. God will provide. And they journey on. Abraham binds Isaac. And we're told Isaac's about 13. Isaac's old enough to fight back, but Isaac willingly allows himself to be bound. <coughs> Isaac is placed on the altar. And it's not until Abraham has his Knife in hand. Ready to sacrifice that which is most important. That the angel of the Lord stops. And says, look over there. See, Almighty God is in the business of testing us. With a question. Do you trust me? No matter what I do, no matter where I lead you, no matter how much questions you have, no matter how, whatever, do you trust me? Do you trust me enough to follow you wherever I may lead you? Next slide. And the ultimate question is this. Do you trust me? God's question to Abraham, God's question to you and I. Do you trust me enough to be your everything? 
Even if I take everything else away from you, and you're left with just me, am I enough for you? Abraham, do you trust me that much? You see, it's the same question that God asks each of us. Next slide. Faith is rooted. Faith is established in the unwavering assurance that in all things, at all times, in all ways, our God is more than enough. Amen? Amen. So friends, let me ask you the question that God's asking Abraham, is God enough for you in all things, at all times, in all ways? Is God enough for you? That's what faith requires. Despite uncertainty, regardless of questions, Abraham journeys on, bolstered by an unshakable faith in the God who had been testing him since the very beginning. God, I don't know what you're doing. I, I, I don't know why you're requiring this of me. I've got a ton of questions, Lord. But here it is. Here's what you require, and here's what I'm doing. And it's not until, as I said before, the knife is raised, ready to plunge down into the child of the covenant, that God stops and interrupts Abraham. Next slide. Genesis 22, verse 12. And he, the angel, said, Do not lay your hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abram, do you trust me? I trust you, even with that, Lord, which you've promised to give me. Even with that which is most dearest to me, Lord, I trust you. And because of Abraham's faith, which promotes his obedience upon Mount Moriah, Almighty God lavishes God's blessings upon Abraham, and Abraham takes his place in faith's Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. Next slide. The Hall of Faith, of, of, the hall of faith includes Abraham. In Hebrews 11, verses 17 and through 19, we read this. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking, he, Abraham, did receive Isaac back from death's grip. Do you trust me in all things, in all ways, at all times, to be more than enough for you? That's God's question this morning to you and I. Friends, never forget that faith is forged in the crucible of real life living. It's forged as we say, yes, Lord, I absolutely do trust you. Yes, Lord, I'm willing to lay everything that's anything to me upon your altar so that nothing stands between us any longer. Yes, Lord, I trust you enough to follow you wherever you may lead. Even though the way is uncertain, even though the path is littered with obstacles, even though there's questions that remain and linger in each of us. Yes, Lord, I trust you, even here, even now, even today, to be my everything. Friends, this journey of faith has become deeply personal for Marty and I over the last six months. Do you trust me enough to lay it down. That's the word. No, really, lay it down. I, I hope so, Lord. Do you trust me to go to Grand Haven? What? I, 
I'm doing work here, Lord. No, I know. Do you trust me to walk where I'm leading you? I hope so. Friends, last week Sunday I had the privilege of preaching at Second Grand Haven C or RCA. All the time God said, do you trust me? It's been a six month journey of God, do you trust me? God asking that question, do you trust me? What choice do I have? Yes, Lord, I trust you. I'm here to report back from my time away from you last week that a call was extended to be the associate pastor of Second Grand Haven, RCA. I've accepted that call. Six months of a journey of God, do you trust, God asking, do you trust me? <laughs> do you trust me enough to be here every day? Do you trust me even though you don't know the way? Do you trust me even though you have questions? Do you trust me? Enough to be your everything. In no way, shape, or form has this been easy for the Norman family. Understand us when we say that we have learned to love you unconditionally. We have learned to see through things that are beautiful in and of themselves, but things that aren't so beautiful in and of themselves. We've heard your stories, we've lived life with you, we've ate with you, we've fellowshiped with you. And so understand that this morning when I say yes, I have accepted that call, that's not an easy decision for me to make. My heart is breaking, but it's the decision that God's asking. Do you trust me enough to be your everything? Let's pray together. Do you trust me? Do you trust me enough to be your everything? Do you trust me enough, Lord, that is the question you're asking us. Do you trust me enough to go where I lead? Do you trust me enough to pick up the pieces, the questions, the uncertainty, the obstacles and the landmines that we'd like to place in the way? Do you trust me enough to get out of my way and let me be God in your life. And Lord, we pray that we might respond. Yes, Lord, I believe. Yes, Lord, I'm willing to trust you with my everything. Yes, Lord, I, I understand and know that in all things, at all times, in all ways, you are good. And you lavish your goodness on us. But Father, I pray this morning that we would have the conviction of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that, Lord, as he's hanging on the cross, he, he cries out, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He willingly relinquishes, surrenders, and submits himself to your will and way. And Father, I pray this morning that that would be our prayer. Here I am, Lord, send me. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where, where the journey will take me. But I'm journeying on, Father, guided by faith. Because I know and I believe that you are a good, good God. And so, Father, where we falter in our faith, build us up. Where we've made life too much about us and not enough about you, return us to your way. Lord, as you ask that question, do you trust me? May our answer be an unequivocal, wholehearted, yes, Lord, I trust you. Because I know that in all things, at all times, in all ways, you are trustworthy. You are more than enough. May this be the prayer of our life. We offer it to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's we'll stand together and say, He will hold you.
prayers to receive God's parting blessing, to guide us into our week rejoicing. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory, with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve.